All right, good afternoon, folks. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, uh, so thank you for coming back. And I see some, what appear to me at least, to be new faces, so welcome. I'm Roger Ward. I'm Vice President for Operations and Planning and one of the co-chairs of the self-study process. Um, the other co-chair is Dean Eddington from the School of Pharmacy, and I'll introduce Natalie in a little while um, after I go through a portion of the presentation. Before I get into the presentation, I want to acknowledge those of you who have been involved in the process from the outset. We've been at this for two and a half years now, and many of you in this room um, have been engaged from the outset. Many of you have gotten engaged at different points in the process. And for those of you who are um, newer to the process, thank you for becoming engaged. It's a very, very important process, as we'll talk about in the presentation. So I wanted to start by acknowledging all of you for being so engaged in this very important process. It has been a process that has been ongoing for the past two and a half years, and we're at the tail end now of the process. And so essentially what that means is this presentation, therefore, is mostly informational to let you know where we are in the process, what's left to be done, and to share with you so sort of like where we've been and where we are currently and then what's next in the next actually three weeks from now when everything that we've been pre preparing for comes to a head. For those of you who've been engaged throughout the process, you would have had the opportunity early on to pose questions, help shape the self-study which is now in its final form and so on, and had the opportunity to provide input and feedback and over the course of two and a half years, that document has evolved and over recommendations change, language change, information change, and the document shaped by input from folks all across the university in settings and venues like this one. So the document has been submitted to Middle State, so it's finalized. So what we are talking about now is that final document. So there is no table exercise for those of you who came to these sessions in the past when we set you up on these wrong tables we gave you work to do um, there is no work to do this time around in terms of what do you think of this recommendation what do you think of that recommendation what's the strength of that recommendation versus the strength of this one should we include this should we take that out um, we've, we've gone past that process now and right now it's just getting ready for the site visit so and for those of you who've been through this process, you've heard me talk about this over and over and over again. This is probably your second to last time you will hear me talk about this uh, ahead of the team visit. But it, it's always useful, I believe, to start by giving and reminding everyone of why we're here. And I always like to start by pointing out, unlike many institutions that go through this accreditation process, and all institutions of higher education go through some accreditation process. We are very different here at UMB in that because we are a graduate and professional campus, we have a very active cycle of accreditation and a culture of accreditation on this campus. Most campuses get accredited on some cycle. And if they're a Middle States campus, it's usually on a 10-year cycle. So they only engage in this process once every 10 years. Because of how we are configured here, and because each of our professional school is accredited by what we call a specialty accreditor, those schools, as you will see in a little while, are in different phases of accreditation. So as a campus, we always have accreditation activity going on on this campus, albeit most at the school level. So our faculty, our staff, our students, especially in the schools, are used to being accredited. They don't have to ask what is accreditation and why it's important. So what we have spent our time doing is educating the university community about middle states because the folks are very familiar with their school-based accreditation but not as familiar or was not as familiar with the middle states process which comes around every 10 years. So each of our professional schools is accredited by a specialty accreditor 
And some schools, for example, in the School of Medicine, there are even programs within the school are accredited by a specialty accreditor. So again, we have a very robust culture of accreditation on this campus. And this infographic depicts that culture, that, that activity that happens on this campus. You see all our schools, you see the different accrediting bodies, and you see the timetable. It's all over the map. As a matter of fact, anyone here from the School of Medicine? No? No? Okay, one person over here. Um, the School of Medicine, and they're probably all exhausted, because the School of Medicine just completed the LCME site visit, was it last week? Again, something they've been preparing for for a very long time. So again, an active culture and environment of accreditation at the school level. Miller States is about accreditation at the university level. And it's accountability, frankly, to the federal government. And what the federal government has done, it has delegated the evaluation of institutions of higher education that receive federal funding, whether through financial aid, federal grants, and other forms of federal support, which is in excess of $100 billion, to the evaluation of those institutions and the accreditation of those institutions to six regional accreditors. And Miller States is one of those regional accreditors. And that's, um, this is how the map is divided up by the federal government in terms of accreditation. We're in the, the pink, if that shows up on the screen, area on this map, and that's the middle stage region. That's where we are located, and so our regional accreditor is middle states. So middle states is one of the recognized regional accreditors, and again, there are only six of them recognized by the federal government, and these accreditors have the delegated responsibility for accrediting entire institutions, not the individual schools or the individual programs at those institutions. It's the entire institution, right? And you see the, the jurisdiction of middle states here, and obviously Maryland falls within that jurisdiction. So what is so significant about the middle states accreditation? Well, it's of course, as I mentioned before, distinct from the process in the schools. Right? And those schools undergo their own very focused and very important process. But unlike the school-based accreditation, the middle states reaccreditation certification is the one that allows us to receive federal support. And so students who come here, borrow federal loans, get federal support, and so on, the federal grants that come here, it is the middle states stamp of approval that allows this institution to be a recipient of those funds. So let's just say for the sake of argument, we were not to be reaccredited by middle states, notwithstanding the fact that each of those schools would still have their accreditation, students won't be able to come here and receive federal support. The, the researchers in the schools won't be able to get federal grants. So with, this is the accreditation, as I like to say, and as middle states like to say, that really matters to the institution. Because quite frankly, without it, the programs, the schools, the activities in the school would be at risk without this accreditation, which is why we spend so much time getting ready for it and getting ready to demonstrate that we're in compliance with the standards. So our last actual site visit was in April 2006. I wasn't here at that time. I know a lot of you were here um, in April 2006. Any of you remember the middle stage process 2006? I know Trisha does. Um, and there's some other in the room who would, MJ and, and company, I'm sure. Um, and then in November 2011, every five years, there's a check-in period where you do a very brief report saying, hey, did you guys have any recommendations from your last visit? And what are you doing to address those things? Give us an update. So it's 10 years for the site visit and five years for our check-in. So we had our last check-in and reaccreditation um, acknowledgement from Middle States in 2011. So Middle States accredits on 14 standards. 
And that's what we've spent a tremendous amount of time and effort demonstrating that we're in compliance with. Right? And the standards focus on two fundamental questions. Are we, as a university, achieving what we want to achieve? So are we achieving our mission? And what should we do to improve our effectiveness in terms of achieving our fundamental goals and in pursuing our mission? That's what Middle States is looking to evaluate as a part of the process. I mentioned that there are 14 standards. These are the 14 standards. They are divided up into two buckets, seven each. One set of standards, the first seven, look at the institutional context, our mission, our, how we allocate resources, um, of the leadership, how the leadership of the organization is set up, whether we have a robust, well-functioning shared governance process in place for faculty, staff, and students to engage with university leadership, the president, all the way down, uh, whether we have a competent and capable administrative team, both at the university level and the school level. Remember, this is all university-wide, so they're looking across the institution. And whether we have integrity in our practices. And very importantly, standard seven, which you see seven and 14 highlighted in red. These are by Middle State's own standards, and um, from their perspective, the two most important standards. Institutional assessment. Are you routinely reviewing yourself, collecting data to assess how well you're doing, measuring your performance, and using that data to drive improvement? So assessment is huge for Middle State, and I always these days, every time I say huge, <laughs> I wonder if I'm sounding like Donald Trump, um, because he sort of like has, um, he might as well patent that, that word right now. Um, so institutional assessment is huge for middle states, um, and that is, that, that, that is, cannot be overstated. On the, in the other bucket are the remaining seven standards, and they are also very important, and it moves to now educational effectiveness. Do you have the infrastructure in place, the infrastructure in place to support your educational effectiveness? So they start looking at your student admission and retention admission and retention of your students, the support services you have in place, financial aid, what you have in your campus center, your recreation and fitness facilities, and all the other wraparound services we provide students. They evaluate those to see how effective they are. Uh, the faculty, are your faculty well qualified? Are most of them full-time faculty members? Are they, how many do you have on the tenure track versus the non-tenure track? How many adjunct faculty members are teaching your students? And what's the ratio of faculty to students and all that stuff. Are your faculty members from reputable institutions and do they know how to teach and so on? So they focus very, very sharply on faculty. And what do you offer here in terms of your educational offering? What, what, what programs are students taking here? Law, medicine, what have you? And how do you evaluate those programs? General education doesn't apply to us because we are not an undergraduate campus. So that's one standard that we just put NA, and you will see that in a chat later on. And then what other relate, related educational activities do you engage in as a campus, and how are you evaluating the effectiveness of that? That's our community engagement initiative that involves our clinical activities outside of the classroom, service learning programs, things of that nature. And then, of course, assessment of student learning. This, again, notice that both in bucket one and bucket two, assessment is a key component. How are you evaluating whether or not your students are learning what you say they will learn when you take their money, when you admit them to this institution? And how are you measuring, in fact, that they are learning these things? And where you, you realize you're coming up short in terms of what they are learning, what are you doing to fix it? That's what assessment of student learning is all about. So as I like to say, and when you go to national meetings for middle states, they tell you when institutions fail to be reaccredited or are given recommendations or find themselves in trouble, it's usually because they have struggled with demonstrating compliance with standards 7 and 14. Those are the two that trip up most institutions, and that's where there's a lot of focus by 
middle states. All the standards, to be sure, are important. In fact, unless you demonstrate compliance with all 14, you cannot be reaccredited. So it's not as though these are the two, seven and 14 that are most important and all the rest you could get a, you could get a pass on. You have to demonstrate compliance with all 14 standards. So we've been at this for two and a half years to demonstrate compliance with those 14 standards. We started this back in actually the summer of 2013 and then officially kicked it off by visiting with middle states in Philadelphia at the Middle States Self-Study Institute where the whole thing got launched. And middle states requires you to start this two and a half years out. So it's not that we were just ambitious and started to do this two and a half years out. We were made to start this two and a half years out. And then you see the other steps through the process um, along the way, and along the way we engaged with, with many of you along the way as we went about hitting these various milestones. And I'm happy to say with the support of all of you in this room, with many of the folks not in this room, with your deans, with your vice presidents, we have been able to hit and clear every single milestone that is and was required along the way. So we've, we're almost there. The last two are yet to be checked because that's where we are now, right? We're hosting town hall and town halls at information sessions. This is a town hall information sessions are smaller sessions. I did one last week with the GSA. Natalie is going to do one in the School of Pharmacy with her leadership team and her faculty. I'm leaving here after this one to go do an info session in the School of Social Work with the faculty council in the School of Social Work. And I think, Jeff, I'm coming to the USGA tonight to do an info session. So we're doing a bunch of these info sessions to, again, bring people up to speed, having been engaged in this process for two and a half years. People want to know, where, so where did we end up? Where did we land? So we're doing those info sessions. And then the big event is hosting the evaluation team. And there, we have a logistics team in place, Melinda, Huge, Trisha, and a bunch of other people, Flav, and a bunch of other people we been meeting almost weekly to manage the logistics of the entire self-study, but right now our focus is on the logistics around hosting the team and welcoming them to campus. So this is our team chair. She visited it with us as a part of one of the steps along the way, Dr. Denise Rogers. She's vice chancellor for interprofessional programs at Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences. So she's part of the Rut Rutgers um, system in New Jersey. Interestingly enough, she was interim president at um, University of Medicine and Dentistry in New Jersey when it was merged. That, that word merged ring a bell with anybody. When it was merged <laughs> with Rutgers. And she, so she's our chair. So she has a very interesting perspective on where we are uh, in terms of pending legislation and so on. Um, but she assures us that's not going to be an issue for the site visit. They're going to be focused on the 14 standards, and that's what they're going to be focused on. Uh, it also happens to be true that she's a middle states commissioner, and there are only a handful of commissioners, and it is very rare for an institution to have as its site visit chair a middle states commissioner. So we are both fortunate and fortunate. Because we can't pull the wool over Dr. Rogers' eyes. She knows what she's looking for. She knows what middle states' expectations are. She helps set them as a commissioner. So she'll be able to give us very good feedback on where we are as an institution and how well we're doing. And she already did that when she visited with us last fall to provide us some feedback on our first draft of the self-study. She was very thorough, provided us with very good feedback, and it's based on that feedback that the document has evolved. So she was here with us in November. We took her out to Shady Grove. She was here for two days. She drove out with Natalie, drove back with me, and we spent a lot of time out at Shady Grove, very impressed with what she had seen at Shady Grove. So she's leading the team to, um, in, in a few weeks. Here's the rest of the team. As you will see, what Middle States does 
it reaches out to all the institutions in the middle state regions. It looks across those institutions, says what are the institutions that have some profile that somewhat resembles UMB. Now, we are a very different institution in the middle states. There are only about five of us that have the classification we have, the Carnegie classification that we have. So it's really very difficult to find people at institutions who would understand the type of institution we are. So they're very careful about not picking people from a traditional liberal arts college who would get here and say, what? The deans operate so independently? They don't report up to a provost? What kind of place is this? So they find people who are at institutions like ours for whom that makes how we are organized makes perfect sense. So these are the folks that will be visiting with us. Um, you see their names here, you see the institutions they represent, and we could certainly share what their titles are. Some of them are coming out of student affairs. A there's a finance person on the team. There's an instructional learning person on the team. There's a librarian, of course, right, MJ, on the team. Um, and so on. There, of course, you have Dr. Rogers, who herself, I should mention, is a MD and um, a family practitioner and someone who is also very keen on interprofessional education. So they put together a team that could look across all 14 standards and would have expertise in evaluating us on each of the 14 standards. I will stop there because my co chair will pick it up from here. But before I turn it over to her, are there any questions about anything I've said? yet. Any questions? And I should have said that from the outset. You could stop me at any point and ask for clarification or if there are any questions. I'm happy to answer them. Or was all of this crystal clear? I take that as all of this was crystal clear. Um, happy to introduce the Natalie Eddington, Dean of the School of Pharmacy. I want to put a disclaimer out there. You will notice that Natalie is wearing an eye patch. I had nothing to do with that. She has been running around campus telling people that the middle stage process has been a bloody and brutal one, and hence the reason um, I had nothing to do with that. Dean Eddington? Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. He, he really did hit me. <laughs> but that's okay, I'll survive. So um, I have the opportunity to share with you um, the process that we use as our guide for our middle state assessment. And so one of the first things that you saw on our timeline was really establishing working groups. And, and our self-study committee. Our self-study committee uh, had representatives from across the campus, faculty, students, as well as staff. And we worked together over a two-year period and really got to know each other and really allowed each other to share their thoughts and their vision. And it, I think it was a very um, important process, but also a very nurturing process. And so one of the things, the first things that we did was we established what we called uh, working groups. And each working group had a theme. So the, this list represents the working groups that we decided to work on our self-study. Now the working groups and the way that we organize our self-study, we, we did two things. One, obviously, we were involved and focused on the evaluation of the 14 standards. So that was the first thing. But what we did that I think was, um, I, I can say more interesting, but, uh, but it was more interesting, especially for, for the committee, was we established a number of research questions that really took an introspective look at the university, some of the activities surrounding the university, some of the strategic goals of our previous strategic plan. And we were fortunate to really do this in a way that we could use a lot of the outcomes of the working group's themes as a starting point for our strategic plan that we're now working on. So the study, self-study working group and the themes are 
Number one, education, innovation, and transformation. And here we did a, a, a look at how do we use technology to support uh, delivery of our academic programs. We also looked at research, scholarship, and entrepreneurship. And here we're very interested in, in really campus-wide embracing diversity in research and really acknowledging that those do diverse types of research do and are an appropriate way that our faculty can share scholarship. We also looked at entrepreneurship and talked about what are those ways that we can enhance entrepreneurship on our campus. The third area was student life, career development, and support services. And here the big focus was how do we ensure the sustainability of our programs and the affordability of our programs to our students. Institutional effectiveness, now this was uh, a very interesting um, theme because as, as Roger said, all of the schools on our campus undergo accreditation all the time. But what we hadn't done is really look at an accreditation and assessment process university-wide. And so this particular thing really, really helped us to focus on that. And finally, community engagement. Uh, we know that community engagement is one of our st strategic plan priorities. And here we were really looking at how do we capture uh, the energy and the activity of all of the uh, community engagement activities that we have ongoing on the campus and use them in a more uh, strategic way. So these were our study themes. So our key findings, and Roger shared with you the 14 standards, the most important point in this whole presentation is number one. UMB is in compliance with all 14 standards. I wouldn't say nothing else matters, but that's the most important thing. Also, as I mentioned, the self-study, because of the uh, working groups that we had, we really had a number of opportunities to inform our strategic planning process. This is a list of the standards, and you can see each of the standards, missions and goals, planning, resource allocation, and institutional renewal, institutional resources, leadership and governments, administration, integrity and institutional assessment, all compliant. The next set of, the next set of standards, student admissions and retention, student support services, faculty, educational offerings, general education was in a related educational activities and assessment of student learning, all in compliant. And so this is very important, and obviously this is a, a very important part of our um, strategic, of our uh, self-study plan. These are our six priorities that the committee came up with to really focus our strategic plan. And, and we did a, a lot of discussions around the outcomes of the research that each of the working groups did. And these are some of the, the uh, suggestions that they had as it relates to the work that they did. So the first thing is we want to create a financial aid program that ensures a UMB education is affordable to Maryland students from all ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds. Secondly, we want to advance a culture that promotes conventional and non-traditional sources of research funding, inter-school and cross-school collaborations in research and teaching, and integrity and scholarship as well as clinical care. The third priority, offer student learning opportunities that open up a diverse set of professional and entrepreneurial career pathways. Number four, enhance our IT infrastructure to more fully integrate student learning and faculty development across all of our schools. Number five, adopt a management framework that assesses each administrative and academic unit's progress and key areas in student learning, outcomes, career out outcomes, tuition, affordability, community engagement, governance, diversity, inclusion, and fundraising. And finally, to instit institutionalize the university's community engagement strategy. So, and, and now we are now in the process of using the outcomes of our self-study process to inform our strategic plan. So I think we've got a very good start here. So, what can the middle states do when they come for their visit? Now, uh, the first three are uh, 
actions of the middle state. They can suggest in the team report uh, something that they would like to see change, but they don't require with these suggestions a follow-up for that in the next, but they do not require responses in the next periodic report. They can have recommendations, which may require specific follow-up by the university uh, and additional reports to document the recommendation and how we have handled it. Requirements are included in the team report only if our, the team, the self-study team, finds that the institution is not in compliance. Now, we believe since all of the standards we are compliant in that we will not see any suggestions, recommendations, or requirements. Right, Roger? We hope. We hope. Well, I, I, what I would say is that we certainly don't expect to see any requirement because we believe we're in compliance with all 14 standards. But, Middle State, even though you're in compliance with all 14 standards, Middle State has been known to still give you suggestions and or recommendations to bolster your compliance with a particular standard, even if you're already in compliance with the standard. Right? So obviously, because we are all so very ambitious, what we are striving for is a report where we have no suggestions, we have no recommendations, and so on. But it's not too far-fetched to, to conceive that middle states might say, yeah, you guys are good, but you could always improve in this area or that area. So here's a suggestion or here's a recommendation. But we're hoping that we don't get any other. So the commission's final decision may include several types of actions, ranging from re reaffirmation of the accreditation, so that will be another 10-year span, reaffirmation with required follow-up reports, especially if we, we re receive recommendations, warning, which we will not get, probation, which we will definitely not get, and uh, show cause why accreditation should not be removed. So we don't have to worry about any of these, but I think that um, um, what we are, what we most likely may see as, as Roger uh, suggests, as what Roger mentioned, are, are some suggestions. So what should we, the university community, expect during the site visit? The evaluation team will spend three days meeting with faculty, staff, and students all around the campus. They will have meetings in almost every, every school on campus, as well as certain other buildings. The evaluation team will review supporting documentation and may request additional information. And the evaluation team will draft and present its final report to the university community before it leaves. And so all that will be done. So when they leave, we will have a initial assessment of their view of how we achieve compliance with our 14 standards. And so we will get that feedback in an open forum at the School of Social Work. Uh, the, the chair of the committee will read out that report. Uh, we don't get to say, well, that's not right, no. We don't get to do that. We just get to listen and to hopefully at the end of that, that um, presentation uh, be happy because we have done a great job, which I think we have. What happens after the site visit? The Middle States Commission on Higher Education will meet and decide whether to reaccredit UMB. UMB will begin working on addressing recommendations, if any, from the Middle States final site report. A UMB will use information developed during the self-study to inform its strategic plan. Where can you find more information about Middle State self-study process? On our website, there, we have posted the self-study document, the self-study timeline, information about Middle State, information about our, our steering committee and our working groups, uh, university-wide communications about the self-study process, and a mechanism to ask a question. And the final Middle States document is how many pages, Roger? 3,000? 3,486. So if you don't have much time on your hands, there's something that you can read. Much of that is in your in the uh, appendices. appendices. Right. The actual document itself, the self-study report, is about 175 or 80 cents somewhere around there. It's, a, it's, a easy, it's an easy read. So you right. can really it's a nice read. It's an easy idea. It's an easy read. A lot of interesting graphics that put a lot of information together. 
I think it's the, it's the number of pages don't have already to clear you, but we have to do it away to document the format to make it look uh, visually appealing and so on. So it's really a very easy read. And if you have the time, at least do that and to see what the document looks like and reads like. But you learn a tremendous amount about the institution. It is remarkable how much we have learned throughout this process sure. about the institution, about the schools, about the goal, the objectives. And so on, and right, and it, and the document, the tables are very informative uh, throughout the document. When we're when we're really trying to justify our response to standards, we have an overview of what's going on in each school. And I think, from a perspective of looking at how we're addressing certain issues in each school, it, it's very interesting to see the approaches that we've all taken, the special kinds of programs that we have to support our students or our faculty. Um, it, it's a very comprehensive document, and as, as Roger said, it's very easy to read. I, I read it probably about three times now, and um, I was able to uh, complete it within one sitting. So, I didn't touch the appendices, though. <laughs> well, thank you. I think that's it. Uh, I want to take some questions. Any questions? For those of you who've been a part of the process from the outset, anything you want a group like this to know? about the process and where we are been and for those of you any questions in general about anything that we've presented today like I said at the outset this is mostly informational to let you know where we are in the process because we did commit at the outset to keep routinely and regularly informing you as we made progress towards the site visit. We do have the, we have a takeaway for you. So with that, so I summarize a lot of what we said here. I see a hand over there for a question. The section that you came up with um, for the strategic plan, the five-year strategic plan moving forward, can you tell us what it means to institutionalize community engagement? Jeff, you want to take that one? <laughs> um, sure. I'm pointing to Jeff because Jeff was one of the, the, the co-chairs of that working group. So Dr. Rebecca Wiseman from the School of Nursing and I uh, were the co-chairs for the Community Engagement Working Group. And in the end, all of the recommendations that we had compiled ended up outlining exactly the requirements that we needed in order to qualify for the alternate community engagement institution classification um, by the Carnegie classification system. So I think that's a lot of the ways that we plan to institutionalize that, is by meeting those requirements and then in the next cycle applying for that alternate classification. Yeah, I think what we found throughout the process is that we have like so many things here, our schools, our programs, the students themselves, our faculty themselves are doing so many interesting things in the community. We had a, took a lot of time and effort of the people in the working group, people outside the working to get our arms around the scale and scope of what we were doing. Uh, but what we found was that we didn't have a common vision, mission, theme, approach to community engagement. And one of the goals we have set for ourselves is to, in 2018, file an application with the Carnegie Foundation to be designated um, to get that community engagement institution designation, which is a very prestigious designation by the Carnegie Co foundation for institutions who are really committed to, to community engagement. But in order for us to do that, when you look at what they require as a part of that application and, and what you would be, the application would be evaluated against, there are a number of things in there that we have to do institution-wide. So because what Carnegie wants to make sure is that this is truly a part of the institution's mission and vision and not a decentralized approach by interested party. This is something that's really important to the institution. So they want to see that we have taken steps, for example, at the university level to allocate resources in our strategic planning process to strategic planning. And that resource allocation isn't left to a dean like Natalie, who happens to be interested in community engagement. The interest and the resourcing of community engagement is done at the highest level of the institution. So that's what we're getting at when we talk about institutionalizing community engagement. It's really aligning what we do to meet the standards of the Carnegie classification. Any other questions?
So one last ask before you leave. Natalie mentioned that report out on Wednesday the 6th. That's going to be done, I believe, Melinda, in the School of Social Works work Auditorium. If you're available at all, I think it's on the schedule maybe for 10 o'clock or something like that. As many of you as possible who could attend, please attend. We want to, of course, show our evaluators that we have an engaged university community. But more importantly, having spent the university, spent so much time preparing for this, I think it's important if you hear directly from the evaluator. We'll, of course, follow up with a report of what was said and how they thought we did and so on. But I think it would be useful for you folks to hear directly from the evaluators their perception of where we are strong and where we might be able to, to make improvements. So if you could attend that event at all, please put it on your calendars. And some of you in this room are scheduled currently to meet with some subset of the evaluators during those three days that they're here. Um, we'll be in touch with you to let you know exactly what you could expect in those meetings. This group should know, this room should know that we are not scripting anybody and you know, putting words in anybody's mouth because we don't feel it necessary to do that. We have a very strong institution. We have very capable faculty, staff, and students. And we want the evaluators to get a true picture of who we are. So we have these meetings scheduled, and they'll meet with folks across the institution. They also have the option, they will be based in the library, to just walk around campus and encounter people as they go. And they may encounter some of you. And they may ask you questions. I don't know what they will ask. But again, you should just feel free to an answer as candidly and as freely as you want. Um, I don't think we have anything to script you about. And we are not asking that anybody give anybody any false impression of who we are. I, I don't, we don't think that is necessary. It certainly doesn't align with our core values of transparency and so on. So again, don't be surprised if you're out and about you're in, in the building grabbing a sandwich or a cup of coffee and someone walks up and they're wearing a Middle States um, name tag. If they don't engage you, feel free to engage with them. Ask them, what are you doing here? <laughs> you ask them that. You know what they're doing here. But ask them how their visit is going. <laughs> and so on. So again, you'll see folks around. We'll try to put messages out on your digital boards and banners in the building to welcome the folks. So you'll see a lot of activity in the next few days. All right. Thank you for your time. I see cookies back there. And I, I think we also have the handouts, have they? All right. Thank you, folks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Very good.